how do you measure the mass of a molecule? Well, that is the goal of the mass spectrometry experiment. And one approach is to convert the molecule into an ion with net charge and then use magnetic fields and the fact that when the ion is moving, it has a it exhibits its own magnetic field to deflect the ion and the extent of deflection is a measure of the mass. This is the basic idea behind mass spectrometry. In a mass spec experiment, a sample is vaporized, converted into a gas, and then ionized. And the ionizing can happen through a few different approaches, but I think the simplest conceptually and the most vigorous involves involves what's called electron impact. We bombard the vapor with electrons, and those electrons knock into the molecules and kick off electrons, creating cations. And those cations are then steered toward a detector by a magnetic field to different extents depending on their masses. And so we can th then measure the masses of all the ions produced. Now, after ionization, chemistry occurs. And so we get the molecular ion, the radical cation derived from loss of one electron from the molecule, but we also get fragments derived from that molecular ion falling apart into smaller cationic pieces. So ionization generates these radical cations. They often fragment into neutral radicals and smaller cations. And only those smaller cations are actually detected. The neutral radicals are not deflected by the magnetic field and so just get pushed right on through the instrument and, and right out the instrument without being detected. But the smaller cations can be detected. One example of this idea is shown for, uh, for you here with this compound. So if we took this compound and we vaporized it and ionized it, providing it with energy somehow to kick an electron out of the molecule, we'd end up with this radical cation. This is the structure of the molecule minus one electron, and it's known as the molecular ion because it's the structure of the molecule just lacking one electron. Fragmentation of this can produce the tert-butyl radical, which is neutral and goes undetected, and the tert-butyl cation, which is detected. This mass is going to show up in the mass spectrum output of the experiment. The ionization can be accomplished a few different ways, as we mentioned, and these range from relatively what are called hard ionization methods, which produce a very high energy molecular ion that tends to fragment a great deal, to very soft ionization methods that very gently produce a molecular ion that tend to fragment less. And MALDI, Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization, I believe, is uh, one of the most popular methods for soft ionization. We'll typically focus on EI, which is one of the hardest methods, because we can often get useful information from those fragments. What we actually measure is the mass to charge ratio of all of these molecular ions and their fragments coming off the ionization process. And this is typically denoted as M over Z. Now Z is typically plus one. The charge is typically plus one. And so typically M over Z corresponds to the molar mass of the fragment, although in some cases we can get a plus two charge, in which case to get the actual mass of the fragment, we need to double the mass to charge ratio. And then, of course, after this bending by the magnetic field, the ions impinge on a detector, and that detector puts everything together and generates a mass spectrum, which is the output of this experiment. A typical mass spectrum for methane is shown here. On the x-axis, we have that mass-to-charge ratio. And on the y-axis, we have the relative abundance of ions with those mass-to-charge ratios. So this gives us a sense of the distribution of the masses of ions that come off the sample after ionization and potentially fragmentation. This is the mass spectrum of methane shown on the slide. And there are two peaks to take note of. Now here, they're one and the same, but conceptually they're different. There's the tallest peak in the spectrum. That's what we call the base peak. And there's the molecular ion peak, which corresponds to the molar mass of the compound, in this case, CH4. If the molecule undergoes a lot of fragmentation, the base peak will not match the molecular ion peak. But methane can't really fragment, and so the base peak is the molecular ion peak, and it corresponds to a mass-to-charge ratio of 16. We see it right here, and we denote that molecular ion peak quite often as M plus dot. I'll just say the molecular ion peak. This is the peak corresponding to the radical cation of the molecular sample, the sample as an intact molecule.
on this table we see the relative heights of the different peaks and we'll notice kind of a cluster of peaks here around a mass to charge ratio of 16. So there's the molecular ion. There's an n plus 1 peak which is very tiny but just one unit to the right of the molecular ion peak. We'll explain that here in a second. But we, we tend to see clusters around various regions of a mass spectrum often because protons are readily lost or hydrogen atoms I should say are re readily lost to produce smaller cations. Often the first thing we want to do when analyzing a mass spectrum is find the molecular ion peak. Unless the molecular ion is very susceptible to fragmentation, the molecular ion peak is usually the tallest peak on the rightmost sort of cluster in the mass spectrum. Now fragmentation is quite common and particularly when a very stable cation can be produced via fragmentation, it's quite frequently the tallest peak in the spectrum. But if you look farthest out to the right, the tallest peak in this rightmost cluster is often the molecular ion. So here for example if we know the sample is benzene, well that's C6H6, that corresponds to a molar mass of 78 grams per mole, so we should go looking for the molecular ion here at 78 m over z78 and in fact we see it right there it's the tallest peak in that rightmost cluster pentane is this structure on the right that's c5h12 and it has a molar mass of 72 grams per mole as an intact compound but notice here now that the base peak is not the same as the molecular ion peak. At 72, we've got a relatively tall peak in this cluster. That's the molecular ion peak. But the Binks peak is down here at, looks like, 43, 42 or 43, 43 m over z. Here we have a case where the base peak and the molecular ion peak differ. Now, from the molecular ion's mass to charge ratio, and what's called the nitrogen rule, we can get a sense of the number of nitrogens in the compound if this is unknown. Odd molecular weight typically indicates an odd number of nitrogen atoms in the sample. This is just a quirk of molar mass where the molar mass of carbon is even and although the molar mass of hydrogen is odd, hydrogens typically come in pairs and so generally if you have an even molar mass or an even m over z for the molecular ion, even molecular weight that indicates either you have an even number of nitrogen atoms or no, no nitrogen atoms at all. But typically odd molecular weight often indicates an odd number of nitrogen atoms in the sample. This is known as the nitrogen rule. There are other c elements that we see in organic compounds with odd molecular weight chlorine, bromine come to mind, but we're going to detect these elements using a different approach based on isotopes we'll explain here in a second. One thing you'll notice in many mass spectra is that there's a tiny but definitely perceptible n plus one peak, one unit to the right of the molecular ion peak. What's going on with this? Well, one way we could interpret it is it's, it involves the addition of a hydrogen atom to the molecular ion, but this is not likely in a mass spectrometer where the molecules are very, very far apart. Bimolecular reactions are not likely to occur in a mass spectrometer. Instead, the n plus one peak can be attributed to the prevalence of carbon-13 in some of the molecules of the sample. There's a small but non-negligible amount of this isotope of carbon in any natural sample of an organic compound. It's about 1.1% carbon-13 relative to carbon-12. And this adds up as we add carbons to the molecule. So for example, decane has 10 carbons, C10H22, and we see about a 10 to 1 ratio of M to M plus 1 peaks in the mass spectrum of decane. This is because about a tenth of the molecules have a carbon-13 in them somewhere and thus show up at M plus 1 rather than at a mass to charge of M. Icosane has 20 carbons, C20H42, and in that compound we see about a 5 to 1 ratio of M to M plus 1. With 20 carbons it's even more likely, about twice as likely, right, that the molecule is going to contain at least one carbon-13 atom in it. So this actually suggests a method based on this isotopic abundance deal to determine the number of carbons in the sample by looking at the ratio of the height of the M peak to the height of the M plus 1 peak. Each carbon increases the chances of a carbon-13 appearing by 1.1%. And so we can do some math and think sort of statistically 
to reason about the number of carbons in the sample based on the relative abundance of m plus 1. That said, I'm, we're going to work an example of this on this slide, but we're going to use proton NMR, carbon-13 NMR, and HDI to avoid having to deal with this later. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we start with the ratio of the M plus 1 peak to the M peak. And we're going to multiply that by 100% to get the percentage of molecules that have a carbon-13 isotope in them. And then we divide by the abundance of that isotope, 1.1%. This is going to tell us the number of carbons in the sample, approximately. So in this particular example, we've got a molecular ion showing up right here. We've got the N plus 1 peak down here. It's going to be helpful here to use the numbers in the table. 20.9 relative height for the um, molecular ion at 86. And 1.2 for the N plus 1 peak at 87. So the ratio of those is 1.2 to 20.9 times 100% divided by 1.1. And this comes out to about 5 carbons. Now this is not an exact science because the relative heights are not super precise. But if we round, the closest whole number is 5. And this is our best guess as to the number of carbons in this compound. M plus 2 peaks are also observable in many mass spectra, and these are due typically to chlorine and bromine atoms, which have two isotopes in relatively close abundance that differ in two mass units. Chlorine has chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 in a ratio of about 3 to 1, respectively, and bromine has bromine 79 and bromine 81 present in about a 1 to 1 ratio. So for example, based on this isotopic ratio in a natural sample, we'd expect about a 3 to 1 ratio between the molecular ion and the M plus 2 peaks, if there's a chlorine in there. And if there's a bromine in there, we'd expect a ratio of about 1 to 1. For example, here in this chlorobenzene, notice we have that 3 to 1 ratio for M and M plus 2. And this is a manifestation of the presence of chlorine in the compound. In bromobenzene, well, we have a 1 to 1 ratio of the M and M plus 2 peaks. And this is due to the presence of the bromine and approximately equal abundances of bromine 79 and bromine 81. We're going to stop there with bromine and chlorine, although you can imagine if we have multiple chlorines or multiple bromines in the compound, the statistics start getting interesting. For example, you start seeing a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of M, M plus 2, and M plus 4 if you've got multiple bromines in the sample. We're not going to wade into that, but that's something you may see in more advanced mass spec courses.